by your doctor. All right, so thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, we have Tyler Derman as our guest speaker tonight. Earlier today, he spoke with the students at Santa Margarita um, just about a couple different things. I'm gonna let him talk to you a little bit more about that. But he has five children of his own. He's spoken to over 5 million high school students throughout the country. Um, he's a father. He's been to our school at least 10, or 10 to 12 times. He's fantastic. But let's open up tonight with Father Tim and a little blessing. Good evening, how are we doing? All right, we're here, thank God. Thank God for parents. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, we thank you for gathering us together here for this important topic. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us with your grace and your mercy to do the most important job in the world, to be parents to our children, especially our high school children. We ask you to bless these parents gathered here, the ones over live stream, that they would continue to be strengthened with your hope and with your presence. So we ask that you would bless our speaker tonight, bless each one of our students, and continue to lead us closer to yourself. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And just for everyone here or at home, um, Tyler has written a book that we all recommend that you guys go ahead and, if you haven't had a read, I know some of you here have already told me that you've been reading it. It's called Counterintuitive. Um, highly recommend it, and you can grab a copy. I think he has some copies here tonight if you want one, but ladies and gentlemen, here's Tyler. When they told me they were going to live stream this, I thought, it's going to be a very intimate crowd. Um, maybe you didn't know they were live streaming it. If I were you, I would never have shown up here. Because what if the guy's terrible, you can't leave as easily as you can push a button or close the laptop. So I'm so, so happy you're here. We're just going to go for 75 minutes, and I'll hang around afterwards in case you want to talk some more. Um, just do me a favor. Would you raise your hand if you, your kid suggested or encouraged you to come tonight? Okay. Most of you. Okay. That means those kids are home stealing stuff right now. But anyway... Um, I'm so happy you're here. This is going to be fun. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. One correction about the introduction. I know she said my wife and I have five kids. We actually have four great kids and this other kid. Anyway, so um, <laughs> no, we got five pretty good kids, but they just take turns being jerks. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about, I, I, I need to tell you two things uh, before we dive in. One is everything I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, of course, is about how to be a better parent for a preteen and a teenager today in this culture coming out of what we've just come through as a nation. And um, I've spoken to over, as you heard in the introduction, over 4 million students. It's approaching 5 million now. And I want you to know everything we're going to talk about comes from this unique source. After I speak, and it happened today in the gym here, Students will typically come up to me and want to talk to me about things they've never heard before. They've never told anyone before. At some schools, particularly depending on what time of the day the assembly is, I will be standing there. Sometimes I'll stay at the school for more than an hour or two hours where kid after kid will come up and they'll say things like, I've never told, my best friend doesn't even know this. Can I tell you something? And I used to think I had a special gift because I thought, well, clearly they trust me. But then I figured out it's just that I don't know their friends, parents, or teachers, and I'm leaving town. So I'm a safe person. I actually am not going far tonight when I go home. This is beautiful for me because I live just in South Laguna Beach, and uh, so it's a beautiful drive to get home, and I'll be home probably the same time you will. But anyway, um, the reason I mention that is because I want you to know these things I'm going to share with you are not things that I learned in a book. They're not things I learned when I was a high school teacher. They're not things I learned... Uh, in my master's degree for counseling. These are things that come out of these conversations that I had. These are things that I started noticing years ago were surprising. Don't miss that. I know we got water polo. We got water polo, we got basketball, we've got some musical thing. This is a good school. Um, and plenty of chairs. And so, you know, stretch out if you'd like. Go ahead, make yourself at home. Um, and so, anyway, as, as we dive in tonight, um, I started noticing these things I'm going to share with you were really surprising. As I would listen to these teenagers talk about things, the number one thing they would talk about were relationships. And I always assumed that it would be about romantic relationships or friendships. No. Those were number two and three. The number one thing they would talk to me about is their relationships with their parents and what was going on in their home. And as a dad myself with five kids, we have a blended family. Most of them are gone now. 
Thank you. And we are, uh, you know, we have Jake. He's our adopted Filipino, and he's going to be in high school next year. Um, but what happens with us in our family is that if you're anything like we are, when they hit puberty, things begin to change dramatically. And I thought I had it figured out pretty well. And but as I started listening to these conversations, I started realizing, wait a second, what did you say? And I, I thought I better document this because I want to be the best dad I can. And I've been doing this for over 30 years, um, 5 million kids, about 250,000 a year. Um, you know, it takes a while to do that, just shows how old I am. But in all of these thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations I've had, the consistent theme has been that these things that I learned went against what my intuition told me. They went against what much of our culture tells us as parents. Particularly, there's been a major shift in our culture over the last 30 years or so. And that shift has been dramatic. And so I started documenting, and then years ago, 15 years ago, I found a new passion for helping other parents like myself and Kristen, my wife, who you would love, by the way. Um, she couldn't come tonight, but um, she wanted to, but she says hi. Just so you can picture her, she's 98 years old and really rich, so that's good. Um, <laughs> she's not rich, but anyway, so <laughs> she can't get away. If you're smiling at that, you're an evil human being. But anyway, I'm just testing the audience. This is gonna be fun. So Kristen and I were, obviously wanted to do the best thing that we could with our kids and we found now this passion to help other parents and um, that's why I'm here tonight uh, this is the part of the day that I'm really most excited about and maybe you're at home watching this thing and you're watching it because your teenager told you to watch it and you don't even know what this is about we're gonna help you get clarity about what your kids real needs are because that will inform what your role in their life will be if you're like me, and I know you are in this way, you want to have a close relationship with your teenager. Some of the things I'm gonna be telling you tonight, most of them will go against your intuition. They'll be counterintuitive. Now, the second thing that I, I told you there were two things to begin with. The second thing is that my friends will always, this happens on a regular basis, they'll say something like, hey, Tyler, are you gonna be up in the San Francisco Bay Area anytime soon, or Denver, or wherever? And I travel a lot, and so the answer is usually, yeah, next month or whatever. And then they'll say this, oh good, because we have these friends whose teenager just went nuts and we told them you'd stop by and help. I'm like, you told them that? They're like, they'll feed you. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm a guy, ribeye, medium rare, I'll show up. I rang a doorbell at, at the end of a cul-de-sac in a little town called Danville up in the Bay Area, cute little town. I, I rang the doorbell. All I knew was on the other side of the store was a family with one child. Linda and Rob have a daughter who's 14 named Heather, and Heather was out of control. That's all I knew besides the medium rare ribeye and baked potatoes. So it's late afternoon, I ring the doorbell, Linda answers the door, she welcomes me in, and she could fit in this crowd really well. There's nothing strange about her. In fact, I found out later she's respected in her community, she owns her own business, has healthy friendships and relationships. But she walks me into the kitchen, explaining Rob will be here in a few minutes, just that he's stuck in traffic, it'll be five or six minutes. and. So she sits me down at the kitchen island. I remember it was black granite, because I wanted that at the time until I got it. Now I would never have black granite again. Talk to me later if you need some decorating. Anyway, so I thought, this is beautiful. She slides some scissors aside, some lemonade toward me, and I thought we were gonna small talk, you know, until Rob got there. She just dove right in. She said, Tyler, I cannot wait for my husband. I said, what? She said, I'll just confess, it is out of control. Last week, Friday morning, a week ago today, before school, I was chasing Heather around this kitchen island, screaming at her like a lunatic with those scissors in my hand. I said, how did that happen? She said, it started upstairs. I came out of my room. She did too. I saw her in the hallway. I said, Heather, you cannot wear that top to school. She said, why not? I said, because you can see through it. It's a cover-up for a bathing suit. I can see your bra. Change your shirt. And my daughter looked at me and said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Whatever. Turned her back and started walking away. She said, I know it's wrong, Tyler, but I'm sick of the disrespect. I didn't know what to do, so I went after her. I shouldn't have, but I did. She sees me coming. She starts running. I start running. We go down the stairs. We get to the kitchen. We're going around and around the island. The drawer was open. I saw the scissors. I thought, that'll teach her. I'll cut it off. She'll never defy me again. I said, well, what happened? She said, well, she's faster than me. And I began to smile, but if you were there, I won't forget this moment. She looked down, and I could feel her embarrassment coming off of her. I mean, she had just confessed to this complete stranger about one of those times when she lost it with scissors, a weapon. She's chasing her daughter, and it didn't work. And she looked up at me quickly, 
uh, briefly, and as she looked up at me, um, as if to see, like, was I going to judge her, I said, next time you ought to trip her on the stairs. <laughs> and she smiled and was relieved I wasn't going to judge her. And I began to say, I'm sorry for what you're up against, but the great news is this, and this is true for you and for me. There is always hope when it comes to a relationship with a preteen or a teenager. And tonight you may be here because this is what you do. You show up, you know, you're one of those, like I'm preaching to the choir, you're the ones who are always a ting for kids, I'll be there. Maybe you're here tonight because your kid never talks about school and they said, could you go to this? And you're like, I'll go, whatever it is, because I want them to know I care. Or maybe you're here tonight because like Linda, you're in pain or you have a lot of fear as you look to the future. What I began to say to Heather, I'm sorry, to Linda, was that I've worked with dozens and dozens, hundreds now, families in crisis, who felt like there was no hope, and there are answers and there are solutions. But before I could get that out of my mouth, the screen door opened, in walked Rob. I looked over at him, and he smiled politely, said hello, kissed his wife, sat down. But as soon as I saw him, I thought, I knew this guy did not want to be there. And here's why I knew it. He's a man. <laughs> By the way, if you're in a relationship with a male and you hand us a book, like women, we knew you'd be here tonight. You always show up at these things. And we're seeing a trend of more and more males coming to these things. But if, if you're in a relationship with a male and, and you give us a book like about relationships or parenting, we know what you mean. But you might as well just hand us the book and say, you're a failure, read this person, right? It feels so, and so you can imagine how Rob must have felt with a stranger in his house going to tell him how to raise his own daughter in his own kitchen. But he was really polite, really nice. He sat down. He looked at the scissors and said, she told you? And I said, yeah. And then I tricked him. I said, listen, um, would it be okay? I'm from Hawaii most of my adult life. Would it be okay? I love being outside. Could we just go for a walk and talk while we walk? Well, that was all true. But the real reason I wanted to go for a walk, I did not tell them till the end of the night. But I'm going to tell you now. The real reason was I wanted to put Rob in a position where he would open up. Linda had already opened up. Rob, I didn't know about. I'm going to explain to you, based on a little piece of research, why I wanted to go for a walk. Why, when I do counseling with dads, I go for a walk or I hop in the car and we go for a drive if the weather's not good enough. And so the reason is, and by the way, for the next few moments, I'm going to come back to Linda and Rob. But for the next few moments, I'm going to talk about communication. And, and, you know, we hear that word a lot, but I'm going to talk about communicating with your teenager and how to connect with them, how to get them to talk if they stop talking, because that happens a lot of times. You're, you, I spoke to one mom who's here tonight, and she said her daughter's, you know, a freshman here, and just everything's different, you know. So we're going to talk about communication, but I want to start with this, because it's powerful. By the way, what I'm about to tell you, you will never forget it. You'll start noticing it. I get emails all the time from parents going, that thing you talked about, oh my gosh. So here it is. I don't know if you'll believe me, but it has been proven through research that sometimes males and females misunderstand each other. I'll get you the data if you don't believe it. Anyway, so the social scientists got together and they thought, what if we study how females communicate and then how males communicate, and we figure a way to bridge that gap, we could help a lot of people, sell a lot of books, make a lot of money. They wrote three books. All of them went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. And in the second book, it's called Gender and Discourse. It's very tedious and clinical. But nonetheless, there's this little piece of research where they got these, they thought, let's Let's study girls talking to girls and boys talking to boys. And let's start young. So they got girls who are 6, 12, 15, and I'm sorry, 6, 12, 16, and 25. And they got boys, 6, 12, 16, and 25, to show up with their best friend of the same gender. And when you would show up for this study, all you knew was about friendship, although that wasn't true. And you would check in, and they would look at their clipboard and say, you know what, you're on time. We are so sorry. We've screwed up. We're about 30 minutes late. If you don't mind, would you mind just through that door? There's a couple chairs in that room. Go grab a seat. We'll come get you when we're ready. Well, you're smart. You know what was happening in that room was the study because when we know we're being observed, we change our behavior. You ever see one of those guys in the back in your rear of your mirror? You know, 10 and 2, right? And so what happens is this. <laughs> it's true. I want to be friends with some of them because I might need it. So, um, hi, guys. So what happens is this. The kids would go in the room, and they did not know that there were over 30 miniature, like, high-tech 
nanny cam kind of you you didn't see them but there were these video cameras from every angle they wanted to get face expression body language tone of voice every nuance of communication they had a checklist for everything they got something they were not counting on when the kids walked in there were two chairs side by side just like this there was a mirror on the wall which of course was a two-way mirror but they didn't know that and the kids came in and they were ready they had their laptops open their checklist ready to go they were recording it and this is what they got they started to notice that every female who walked in with her best friend, regardless of age or where they did this study across the planet, they discovered that the girls all did one of two things. They walked in, they saw the chairs, and they either turned the chairs to face each other, sat down face to face, looking at each other, and they talked. Talk, 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 talk. By the way, the females said four times more words during the study than the males did. You know that statistic. Well, wow. um, you know that statistic. Uh, you take a male and female, put them through a similar routine on a given day, the female will use just slightly less than four times more words. And I'll tell you why in a few moments. If the girls didn't turn the chairs to face each other, they sat down on them as they were, and within about 30 seconds had turned their bodies, sat on one leg, and faced each other to talk. Well, they didn't notice this at first until they started having boys come into the room. Every male in the study did the exact same thing. And it was different than what the girls did. Every boy who came in, saw the chairs, went over, sat down, looked at the wall. Every once in a while, they'd mumble something to each other. Da, 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 da. From time to time, they'd get brief eye contact. Da, 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 da. Every once in a while, they'd hit each other. Bang. Apparently, they sounded like Rocky. But anyway, and so, how are you doing? So, what? watch. They started keeping track of this, and every male sat shoulder to shoulder. Every female sat face to face. And of course, one of the conclusions they came to was that males feel most comfortable communicating shoulder to shoulder, females face to face. I was skeptical about this until I realized that the most significant conversations I've had with my four sons have been in the car. Why? Shoulder to shoulder. The reason I wanted to walk with Linda and Rob was Linda had opened up. I wanted Rob to be on my shoulder because males are most likely to open up that way fascinating thing grows out of this research in another piece of their research and it's this when females are good they're face to face right when a female gets upset with somebody what does a female do with their body language typically it's this no don't even look at me. I'm, I'm done talk to my hand right females when they get mad they go shoulder to shoulder males exact opposite when we're good we're shoulder to shoulder we get upset with somebody what do we do you want a piece of this, right? Males go face to face. Face to face in the male world is confrontation. In the female world, shoulder to shoulder is withdrawing and is confrontation. And this has so much to do with how we communicate with our kids. And, and it's a powerful thing. Kristen used to discipline Jake when he was little. Jake's a tough kid. Um, he's got, he just struggles. And um, so he's been our biggest challenge. Uh, Brooke and Caleb, just left home and Brooks at University of Michigan, Caleb's down at Point Loma. So um, Jake, when he was younger, was a real challenge. So Kristen and I would take turns going into deal. You know, we'd say, hey, Jake, go, go to your room. We'll be right there. And when I'd hear Kristen <laughs> down the hallway, she'd be so frustrated talking to Jake. And she'd be like, Jake, don't look at me. Jake, take that expression off. Jake, that is rude. Do not scowl at me. And she'd come out like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then I would go in, and it would go pretty well. And I remember thinking, well, I do have a best-selling parenting book, you know. <laughs> Try saying that to your wife. And, but I would go in, and, I, I, and she's the smart one who figured it out in the end, but I'd go in, Jake would be sitting on his bed, side of his bed, I'd go in and just sit next to him intuitively. I'm a guy. I'd look at the floor and I'd go, so Jake, what's going on? And within a minute or so, he would ease into me. Kristen changed that one thing and, and it dramatically, dramatically changed the way Jake. Jake. And then and Caleb, Caleb uh, he's, he's our, our easiest, easiest kid. kid. Shut, Shut up, up, you have a favorite. favorite. But anyway, Caleb, Caleb he's, he's a point Loma. Loma. He was, he was going, going through something hard, hard. I happened to be on the road, and, and Kristen was like, he just won't talk, talk about it, but I know there's something wrong. Three nights, nights she tried to talk to him. And then and in the fourth night, she remembered this research, she, she went into his room, and sat on the floor in front of his dresser, and said, Caleb, come here, sit next to me. And he's like, what? She's like, just sit next to me. I think he was 14 at the time. And he goes, Mom, this is weird. She goes, I don't care, just come sit next to me. And she called me, and choked up, she said, within a minute, Caleb burst into tears and talked about what he was going through at school. Why? Shoulder to shoulder. 
it's, it's profound. profound. If, if we, we want to communicate and connect with our kids, kids it, it may mean we need to go against what our gender naturally tells us. And again, again this, this isn't me just making this stuff up. up. This, this is research, and you can go and check it out in that book, and, and I can give you that information later if you need it. There's, There's a fascinating, fascinating thing, too, just about females and males, because you may have a child who's not the same gender as you are, and here it is. Females resolve conflict differently than males do. And because we've got so much to cover, I'm going to just fly through this, okay? So hang with me. I'm going to, on this side of the thing, I'm going to, um, over here, oh, hello. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about, this will be the female side. Females do resolve gen, um, conflict in a different way than the males do. So up here in their relationship, whoever it's with, let's just say it's a girl with her best friend, they get into conflict. Up here it's good, down here that conflict is really bad. Well, they get into it in a typical pattern, again, research-based, and get out of it in a very beautiful pattern. This is the female side. Here it is. You ready? Watch. Females, everything's good. Someone gets upset at somebody else, whatever the reason might be. First thing they do is they go shoulder to shoulder. Second thing they do is they stop talking to each other. Third thing, oh, I told you I was going to tell you why females use more words than males do. And, and, and then we'll come back to this. Females need more words because they use communication for something different than males do. When males communicate, we do something very really simple. We have information in our head, we want to put it in your head, and when we've done that, we're done. Picture two glasses on the counter, one's full of water, that's your sunset. The empty glass, you're waiting to hear what's going on in his brain. It's just him walking and pouring water and putting the glasses down and going, thanks, and walking out, right? That's how males typically communicate. Females, it's really different, and this is why they need more words. Females tend, and there are exceptions to this on both sides, but females tend to want to talk not only about what is in their head, but they want to talk about the emotions that are associated with those events or things. And so girls need more words because they're going to talk about how this thing makes them feel. And in fact, females love give and take when it comes to communication. And females, and this was so helpful in my marriage and with my daughter, Females will often use communication to figure out how they feel about whatever the topic is. So females will actually try on different emotions as they talk about it, as if those emotions are present and real, just to see how, it, like trying on shoes or whatever, how does this fit? Is this what? And then the girlfriend will look at him and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Oh, no. And there's conf females have been known to conf contradict themselves within the context of the same conversation. And this, this makes, makes our male heads, you know, explode because they're looking at this like, what, do you love him or hate him? Do you want to marry him or murder him? Just make up two something, right? And it gets us into conflict. So females need more words because of this. And so being the fact that they need to talk not only about the event but about how they feel, they will, it has been proven that sometimes one girl will go to another girl to talk about a third girl behind her back. Surprise. Surprise. Anyway, and, and so, so they will start, start talking, and they, they will start talking, and they will talk and talk to whoever this other person is, and they will talk and talk and talk, and, talk, and, talk, and, talk, and, talk, and then the, the other, other girl might find out what's been said, and she will do the same thing with her friend, friend get down to the bottom, and it's really bad. bad. And this, this is where it gets beautiful. Females resolve conflict, typically in this fashion. First thing that they will do is they will go, they will say, I'm sorry. So one girl, maybe times gone by, she realizes, you know, I don't feel angry anymore. If they're in the same physical place, she'll turn to her friend and go, hey, listen, I'm really sorry. And then her friend will typically turn to her and go, no, I'm sorry. So they'll say they're sorry, and simultaneously they will go face to face. And then they will, and this is research, they will, re they will get physical contact going between them. They might hug at that moment, they might reach out, hold each other's hand, they might stroke each other's shoulders, whatever it might be. And then, so they will touch each other, and then they will talk about what they experienced. And then they will reverse, they will open every file for you, with a file for you. No, that's not what I meant. Oh, that's what you just, oh, you're going to say. No, no, that's not, I knew you thought that. And they'll go back, and they'll talk, 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 Get to the top, look at each other, say, let's promise to never let this happen ever again. They will hug one more time, and then everything's good. That's the female typical pattern. Again, there's exceptions, but this is typical. 
The male, male pattern is, is over here. here. And I'm, I'm going to fly through this one, but here it is. The chart for male conflict, conflict resolution is like this. this. I'm mad at you, everything's cool. cool. Okay, that's <laughs> our conflict resolution. Right? We go from anger to anger, don't even worry about it. And, and so, so this caused me problems as a dad. dad. This, this is much simpler than this. this. And, and so, so when I hurt my daughter's feelings, feelings this, this one time I hurt her feelings because I was already annoyed. You, know, you ever been about your kids? kids? You ever been? Remember Linda, Linda with the scissors? scissors? I think, I think we would all be surprised if you know how many of us sitting here and listening have lost it without kids the way Linda did. We just don't talk about that at lunch on Tuesday, right? We don't paste that on Facebook, right? You know, hey, how are you doing today? Hey, my son so much today. I went in his room when he left for school and stole his money, right? We don't say those things. Oh, you think that's bad? My daughter doesn't know it yet, but when she left for school, I spit in the back of her head, right? We don't tell those stories. And if you're smiling, it's because you have a child. Anyway, and so... Well, I, I was annoyed, and my son's room was messy. They share a room, you know, Laguna Beach. We actually sold an acre in Hawaii and came to Laguna Beach and bought an outhouse. But anyway, um, it's a cute little outhouse. But it, 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 so anyway, my, my, my son's room was, we actually turned the garage into a room. And not, I usually can't say that. They just made it so that's legal now, so they won't take it away from us. So who cares? They're in the garage, and there's a little bathroom, and it's messy. I'm sick of stepping on Legos. And I think Brooke was about 11 at the time. And bless her heart, I'm at the end of this hour. We went to the container store. We're getting it done. My boys had a good attitude. I'm still annoyed, though. This is wasting my time. should never have got so messy. At the end, Brooke walks in, sits down, looks at what we're doing, and goes, hey, Appa. My wife's Korean, so they call me Appa. She said, hey, Appa, why don't you put that stuff in there and slide it over there and move that stuff over there and put that in the corner? And what I thought I did was, oh, Brooke, thank you so much. Oh, it's so sweet of you. It's not even your room. Thank you, but I think we've got to figure it out. Kristen saw what I did. She was walking by at the time. What I apparently did is went, what? No, we got it. I shooed my daughter away with the back of my hand. I didn't mean to do that, but I obviously heard her feelings. Kristen said, you better go talk to a girl. She's in her room. And you know what I knew that meant? It meant I had to enter this world. If it was my son's, it would have been much easier. I could have just poked my head in the door and said, did I hear your feelings? Punch yourself, yourself in the face. It's going to be okay. I love you. And walked walk out. And they would have known I was joking. We would have laughed. Everything would have been fine. But I had to go in and knock on the door. And when Brooke said, come in, she's doing art on her bed. I had to get her desk chair and pull it up to the bed and face her and look her in the eye. And then I had to say words. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have treated you that way. I'm so sorry. And when I said that, I had to reach out and touch her knee. And then we had to talk about how we felt. For like seven minutes, we had to talk about how we felt about it. And then we hugged, and I walked to the door, and I looked back like that was a good talk, and she went, I was like, oh, another one, okay. And I hugged her again, and I went out and closed the door, I was like, I'm so tired, right? Why? Because this is a lot more confused. This is a lot more work for a male, typical male. And conversely, moms, I hear this from sons a lot. My mom just drives me nuts, and I'll say, why? Well, she just won't shut up. And she wants to like, try to get me to talk all the time. Why? Because mom is used to that exchange of information, the cup of water, pouring some back and forth. The son just wants to pour it in and leave. Or just pour it in and not talk. And so what moms do instinctively is moms want to draw it out. Oh, how was your day? Oh, it was good. Yeah, but did anything happen like special at school? Because she's desperate to stay home because he used to come home and tell her everything. Now he's in high school and he doesn't hardly, he goes in and, uh, he goes in and, and into his room on his phone. TikTok, right? Whatever it might be. Or he's tired from practice or whatever he's involved in. Or maybe your daughter. It's the same thing for a dad. And we try to connect with it a way that's just natural for us. And so moms are like give and take and boys are like... She just drives me nuts because as soon as she starts talking to me, I know this is going to be 15 minutes because she's going to ask me, well, who did you have lunch with? And I'll be like, I don't know. It's just some of my friends. It was friends. Right? Because mom wants desperately to feel connected. Now, again, we're talking about communication, and, and uh, we could do hours on it. Um, but I'll give you this. Research came out in the 1990s that it said, and it's true, so it is true today, Kids who have four sit-down meals with their family are four times less likely when they get into their 20s to abuse substances. And that sit-down meals during the week, four a week, 
not drive through but force it down meals. And that made all of us feel tremendously guilty. And parents started to squat, especially in high school, when you don't have it, how do you have four sit down meals? Let's be real. Our kids are going all the time. And so they came out with more research about 15 years later. And they actually studied families who were having dinner. They studied 20,000 families just with cameras. And families got used to the cameras. And during dinner, they found a startling fact. There was, of the whole dinner time, there was only 10 minutes of meaningful conversation. And this is what blew them away. Of the 10 minutes of meaningful conversation during dinner, seven minutes were the adults talking. So they left the kids, one or five or however many you have, three minutes, that meaningful conversation. So they did some more study, and the conclusion is simple, and I love this. Teenagers need us, if we can, to try to or to succeed in connecting with them from 5 to 12 minutes any day we're in their proximity. And if your kid lives at home and you live at home, you don't travel for work when you're home, 5 to 12 minutes. And that's a lot easier, but they still, in high school, it's not going to be normal for them to go, can we have some us time, right? Typically, that's not going to happen. They're stressed and all these kind of things. I want you to know, even the attempt to do that, you get credit. With Brooke, she was our, she's our driven A-plus student, you know, University of Michigan. We had, she, she would cry when we'd say, you got to turn your light out. But I'm not done studying. We'd say, yeah, we don't care. You're not going to be well, you know. And she was so driven. And I remember one night, legitimately, she said, can I have a paper and a test tomorrow? Can I please eat my dinner at, in my room at my desk? And Chris and I looked at each other and we're like, yeah, sure. And when she walked away, I realized I hadn't connected with her in a few days, really connected. We said hi and just passed each other. So I grabbed my plate and I said, I'll be back. And I went down. Her door was shut at the end of the hallway on the right. And I knocked on the door and I could hear it in her tone. She said, oh, yes. She was just annoyed someone was knocking on her door. I opened the door and she saw me and she's like, Abba, I really need to study. And I said, no, I'm not going to get in the way of that. I said, Brooke, I need 11 seconds for you to tell me something. And I had my plate, which she looked at and was annoyed that I was going to say. And, and I said, all I want is 11 seconds for you to tell me something about your day that I don't know. And she swung around and looked at me and she said, really, only 11 seconds? I said, 11. You can time me if you want. She goes, OK. Well, OK, my favorite class is chemistry. I knew that. And her professor was this real personality. And she started talking. And I kept track. We talked. And I hardly said anything. I just asked her questions and clarified things, active listening, you know. She ended up talking for 11 minutes. And then it was like, oh, I really need to get back to it, like I had been keeping her. But that was fine with me because I got to connect with her. She had the sense. You see, a lot of us, when it comes to our teenagers, we want so much to be close to them, but we also have great fears when we look to the future because we know that we've got to get them ready to live life without us. And we know them so well. And we think, how are you going to ever have a relationship if you treat someone like that? So we're caught between this intimate thing and this parent role, and it gets really confusing. And, but our role in our kids' lives, please hear this, is not to get our kids to comply to us. The main role is to build a relationship with them where they know we see them and we hear them. And that's very difficult as they go through the teenage years because they want independence. They have this growing need for this individuality. Their autonomy is justifiably important to them. And so that night, I got 11 minutes. But then, like the next couple of days, two things happened. Like, but, right? And I kept track of them because I thought, ooh, this is interesting. The first one was I was going to walk the dogs. We have two golden retrievers, and um, they're cute, not that bright, but we love them, brother and sister. And I was going by her window, and she was in her study. I said, hey, Brooke. She goes, Hi. yeah. I said, you want to walk the dogs with me? She goes, no, I'm good. And I walked away. It kind of hurt my feelings. I was like, why would she want to spend time with me and the puppies? And, and so then the next night, we were all watching some movie that everyone in our family likes to watch. And I went, and I, hey, Brooke, we're going to watch that movie we've all been talking about. Do you want to watch it with us? And she goes, no, I'm good, thanks. And I walked away. And what I realized is, and Brooke and I have spoken about this since, is that she saw my attempt as valuable as when I got the time with her. And what we often feel when we take it personally is like, well, if I don't get to really get this face-to-face -face time or shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time, I guess we're not close. It's the attempt that matters. We are so surprised our independent daughter calls 
literally every day from UMIS. She's made friends. She's doing great in school. She's studying um, the brain and how that relates to how we see things and how we buy things. It's got a fancy name. I can't even remember the name of what she's studying. She's thriving. She loves her roommate, but she calls every day just to check in. And she missed a day and called and said, I miss you guys so much because I didn't get to talk to you. Brooke was the one who was in the door, get her stuff, get out, and go. Like, we hardly ever saw her. But there's this connection we have, not because we're perfect, and definitely not because we're weak. I'm going to say a few statements now that fold out of this communication thing, and it's this. And we'll show you through Linda and Rob and Heather. Teenagers are like barbecue chicken. I guess we're done. Thank you for being here tonight. No. Teenagers are like barbecue chicken. Just because they look done on the outside does not mean they're done on the inside. Teenagers have lingering childhood needs that will not go away till their frontal lobe stops growing in their mid to late 20s. And the greatest felt need teenagers have is the need to feel safe. Josiah, who hired me at the beginning of my career, in fact, this kid was the day I began documenting what I was learning. After I spoke at, at um, his high school, Marina High School, there's one in Orange County and there's one up in Ventura. This was the one in Orange County. He introduced me. He was a junior uh, student body vice president. I spoke to a bunch of kids. He was waiting at the end. I assumed he wanted to give me a check, walk me to my car. He said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He took me to the top of the bleachers, sat down shoulder to shoulder, and it was just intuitive. And he leaned forward with his elbows on his knees, and he said, I just have to tell somebody something, Tyler. The first tear fell when he said, my dad doesn't love me. And I said, well, what do you mean? What he said was so surprising that I kept repeating it in my head while we talked. And I got to my car, and I turned over a gas receipt and wrote down word, to word, word for word what he said. When I asked Josiah what he meant by the fact that his dad didn't love him, he said this. He lets me get away with pretty much everything. He buys me whatever I want. He never disciplines me. Isn't it weird that a teenager would be saying he wanted more discipline when all it seems that they talk about is more freedom? Josiah was saying that he equated the depth of his dad's love with his dad's willingness to be over him. Your teenager does not want to appear. They need a parent. And it's natural to want to be close to our teenager, but if we see our value in the world or our role in their life based on how much they like us at a given moment, they will see that as weakness. Why? Because they need to know we're stronger than us. Josiah said he'd try to explain it to his dad, but he said, my dad's big on us being best friends because he wasn't close to his dad and he wants to change things. Teenagers want a parent, not a peer. In fact, there's a huge reason why this is true, and it's because, well, actually, I'll just tell you this. When your kid tests you, like Heather tested Linda and Rob, when she pushed against the things they said were important, the standards of their culture, of their family, when she pushed against those things, she wasn't pushing, hoping to win. Oh, she wanted to wear that top to school, don't get me wrong. But Heather was pushing because she needed to know, do you love me enough to be stronger than me? You're saying this is really important. Who's in charge here? Because if I'm in charge, I feel lost. Josiah, this kid who was more sophisticated than I was, he was articulate, he knew more about political science, that kid who introduced me at that assembly, and he wore deodorant. I assumed he was as mature as I was, but Josiah was saying, I need someone over me because I'm not done on the inside yet. I've seen this over and over and over again. You see, our job as parents gets confusing and counterintuitive because, let's just be fair, when we bring our kids home from the hospital and we... You know, in the first early years into the middle of elementary school, essentially, we have two primary jobs. Let me erase this. Okay, uh, we have two primary jobs, right? And I'll just do a pie chart. I like pie. Here we go. Our first pri well, I'm, the pie chart is this. I'll divide it in half, one and two. When our kids are little, in those early days and early years, number one, what we do for them is we provide. And we have to provide. We provide food, we provide warmth, we provide all of their human needs. And if we don't, they will literally die. So this is important. I remember feeding my son, my firstborn, Spencer, who's probably my favorite human being on the planet, Kristen's favorite human being on the planet. It doesn't hurt me when I say it, but it hurts me when she says that. But anyway, Spencer 
is this one. But I was feeding him. It was the first time alone with him, and he wouldn't eat. And I was panicked. I'm a new dad, and I'm alone with him. And I'm like, you have to eat. The authorities know I have you. They have your footprint down at the hospital. You cannot die, right? I was panicked. Why? Because that's my job. i got to provide for you. And then number two, what we do is we protect them. And again, if we don't, they will literally die. That's why we put little gates at the top of stairs, and we shut the door when they start crawling so they don't go outside into traffic. That's why we put those little plastic things into plug holes for our first child. <laughs> if you have more than one child, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? Your first child, they drop their pacifier. You're like, no, burn it. I've got a new one. <laughs> and we shove it in their mouth. Our second child, we're like, oh, here it is. <laughs> and we shove it in their mouth. Our third child, we're like, I don't know where it is. Just go suck my truck tire. It's the same thing, right? We get a little bit more relaxed. But nonetheless, this is what's so tricky. Watch. As they get to the middle of elementary school, we need to add another piece into the pie. And I'm going to state the obvious here, and that's this. To put a third piece into the pie of our role as parents, in order to do number three, we have to do less of one and two. See, it takes up some of the space. And the third thing that we need to do is our ultimate job as parents. And it just happens they all start with a letter P. I hate it when people do that, but nonetheless, it just happened that way. We need to prepare our kids to live life without us. That's our job, because one day they're going to need to know how to manage their time, choose their friends, handle failure, uh, you know, get enough sleep, eat healthy, bathe, you know, do their laundry. Okay, so, and, and by the way, you're looking at your kids right now going, that's a long way away. They'll figure it out when they have no clothes and they like a girl or a guy or whatever. Okay, so, but here's the trick of it all. This one does not feel as good as these two. These two make us feel good. It's like I'm being a dad. Caleb wanted to transfer out of his freshman in, uh, math class. He had a long-term substitute for four or five months. They didn't know, and this guy was legitimately not a good teacher. Caleb loves math, and he's a natural at it. And he came to us the first day. He goes, can you transfer me? We're, out. We're like, no, give it some time. We've got two weeks before we have to decide. Two weeks. He said, you guys, you've got to transfer me tomorrow. My three best friends, he played baseball. His three best buddies did as well. His three best friends had all transferred out of the same class. He's like, could you please? And he looked at me because I have a relationship with the principal at Laguna Beach High School. I could have just called him up. He's on my phone. And I could have said, hey, could you move to Carolina? Yeah. And I wanted to so bad because I knew that would make me hero status. Because I want my son to think I'm cool. I want to walk into the room with my kids and I want them to stand up and salute and say, Captain, my captain. I want them to wear T-shirts to school with my face on them and my dad, my hero. You know, that's what I want. And it's normal. That's my goal. But I can't just, we didn't, we told Caleb, we're not going to transfer you. And, but what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to make this a win-win. Because one day, you're going to have a roommate you don't like, or a middle manager, or a boss that you don't get along with. So let's figure out how to win this teacher over, how to get the help you need. Why? Because our job is to prepare him. Oh, it would have felt much better for him to go, thanks, Appa. That was cool how you know the principal. Thanks for doing this. But we didn't do it, and he was not happy with us. But that's okay with me, because my job isn't to make him happy with me. Because here's the deal. You're listening? This is so important. Your teenager wants to respect you more than they want to like you. And if they sense that you're desperately trying to get them to like you so you can be okay, they will not respect you, because they'll see it as weakness. They will begin to see you as a prop in their life they need to manipulate so they can get what they want. And they know us. They're experts on us. They'll know how to push what buttons, and they're experts at the buttons. They want us to, res they want to respect us more than like us. I'm going to come back to that respect thing. Would you remind me to come back to the respect thing as soon as I'm done telling about Caleb and forgetting his lunch? Okay, would you remind me? Okay, I'm not that bright, so I need help. Let me prove to you why this one is more difficult to do. Kristen, in sixth grade, would drive Caleb to school, drop him off, in the car zone, you know, the loading zone, you know, the school zone, drop him off, and she called me one day. She goes, I can't believe what I've been doing. I said, what? She goes, I did it again today. She goes, Caleb gets out of the car through the back closed window of the SUV. He looks in. The window's usually open, and he says, oh, Mom, please don't be mad. And he means it when he says this. I'm so sorry, but I forgot my lunch. So she'd give him a lecture and go home, get his lunch, and bring it to the office. And it made her feel good. She was annoyed, but at least she was providing for her son. By the way, quickly, another side point we could talk an hour about. Lectures do not work with teenagers. 
You ever catch yourself giving the same lecture over and over and over again? I'll tell you why it doesn't work. They did research on the human brain, and there's a part of our brain that lights up when we're willing to be persuaded or to change our thinking. When you are, are you ready? When you are angry or defensive, the part of your brain that is open to persuasion literally shuts down for approximately 20 minutes. So if your kid's bugged at you or annoyed or whatever it is, and you're like, bah, 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 and you're giving them that, how could you do this? You did it. I never, did. you know, whatever it is, they're just, they know how to politely nod or whatever, roll their eyes, or maybe they walk away and you don't know what to do about that. There's solutions for that too. But lectures don't work. But that's what Kristen had been doing. She's so smart. I respect her so much. She's a very strong human being. She said this to me. She said, Tyler, I've been so dumb. I've been doing this. What's going on over there? A raccoon? Oh, cool. Do you have any little babies? There's a raccoon there. I hear that they're really nice and we should pet them. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's two things you can't compete with, animals and babies. Okay. Um, that's right. Those of you who love your kids will stay, keep paying attention. Okay, watch. <laughs> it's tough to beat that thing. So, Kristen, I said, what are you going to do? She goes, I'm not going to do it anymore. It's his responsibility to bring his lunch. I said, call me when this happens next. She goes, I will. She called me. She's choked up, and she's not given to being choked up over something little. I thought something bad had happened. I said, what's wrong? She goes, I feel stupid for being so choked up. I said, why? She goes, remember the thing with Caleb's lunch? I said, yeah, what happened? She said he forgot it again. He closed the door. I said, Mom, I'm so sorry, but I forgot my lunch. And so I said to him, and she said, I was fine. I said, Caleb, I'm not going to get you lunch. I love you, but I'm not getting your lunch anymore. It's your responsibility to get your lunch, not mine. And so I guess you won't eat today. And he said, what? Can I have some money? She said, we give you allowance. Where's that? He said, I, I spent it all. She goes, well, I guess you won't eat today. I love you, buddy. See you after school. She said she was fine. That thing is so cute. She said... She said he was fine. She was fine until this happened. Picture it. She says what she says. <laughs> I wish you were in my position right now because it's like two of you looking at me and I do not blame you. You can listen and I'll talk. We'll just pretend we're connecting. Okay. All right. It's kind of like being on a date. Oh, I'm glad those days are over. Not that anyone ever looked away from me. But um, she said I was totally fine. I don't know why I feel stupid for being choked up. I said, well, what happened? She said, I told him that. And I said, have a good day. I love you, buddy, but you've got to bring your own lunch. I'm not getting it. As she pulled away from the school zone, he moved to the front window and looked at her like, what in the world? And as she began to accelerate, he followed her. And as she started to pull away, he literally shouted, why won't you help me? Oh, my gosh. That goes against every fiber in her mom's body. Because why? She's made to provide and protect. What kind of mother sends your kid out into the world without any food? But unless she wants to be bringing him lunch at college, she's got to teach him that lesson earlier. But the problem is this doesn't feel as good. What was the thing I was supposed to talk about? Respect. Good. We, we're, we're on scale. And then after I'm done with respect, will you help me remember to talk about freedom? Okay. All right. I said earlier that respect is the foundation of our relationship with our teenagers. They want to respect us more than they want to like us. Oh, and by the way, over here with this thing, see, see piece of pie number three? As they move out of elementary school, this piece, these, this piece needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Until they're in 10th and 11th grade, we're doing very little. Of course, we're providing the things they need so they don't die. But we're doing very little protecting. And that goes against our intuition. There's been a shift that happened in our culture in the last 40 to 50 years, and that's when they started studying this beautiful and important thing called self-esteem. But experts started writing books on it coming out of the 60s when everyone was questioning everything. And if you were ever in the 60s, you probably don't remember it. But anyway, um, so what happened was this. Thanks for getting that, Father. So what happens is this. You're pretty hip. So. They started talking about self-esteem, and they were selling books. And then they thought, let's, let's take this a step further, and that's when they started taking it too far. In our culture, we began telling parents who were desperate to know, what do I do? Because I don't like the way the establishment raised me. So these experts with degrees like mine started writing books saying, well, self-esteem is so important. It's your job to instill a good self-esteem in your kid. And so for the first time in history, 
families and Saturday Night Live made fun of this in a skit. Families started walking their kids to the door in the morning saying, you're wonderful, you're incredible, you're the smartest kid at school, and darn it, people like you. And kids would leave feeling good, and they would have a bolstered self-esteem even though they hadn't done anything worthy of having a good self-esteem. And it began subtly to twist away. And then we were told our job was to protect our kids' fragile self-esteem. Are you listening? To anything that could hurt their self-esteem or anyone that could hurt it. And we began to see ourselves as the protectors of how they felt about themselves. We stopped keeping score at soccer games for little kids, which is ridiculous when you look at the research. Kids who, you know, everyone gets a trophy, that final game. It's ridiculous. Research indicates that kids feel incredibly powerful emotions when they get the same trophy as the team that beat them or the team they beat. The kids who get the trophy, even though they've kept score in their head and they know they didn't win the game, they get the same trophy, they feel shame and embarrassment. And the kids who know they won the game see those kids getting it and they feel anger and resentment. But we keep doing it. Why? Because we're feeding our needs. Because this is so much about us feeling like our role in their life is filling us up and making us important. This has shifted our... our we, the, wholesale parents started thinking, I need to call the teacher at school when my son is upset or my daughter isn't getting the grade they should. I have friends who are administrators. By the way, nobody has said this to me at this school. And if they had, I'd probably quote them right now and tell you who they were. But nobody said this at this school. I wouldn't do that. But I have friends who are administrators, and the number one problem they have in education, I have a friend who wants to quit. He's a, at a very big, successful high school in Colorado. He wants to quit, and the number one reason, he says, is just parents. Parents are meddling in everything. Why? Because we feel that our job is to protect and, and make sure they feel good. And, and we have bought wholesale into this lie that research, and I can't talk about it now because we don't have time, but come to me afterwards. Research indicates what a lie this is, and the lie is that our kids need to get into a very small select group of schools, and if they don't, they're not going to have the best life possible. The truth is they studied kids who um, had similar SAT and PSAT scores. Half of the people they studied went to Ivy League schools. Half of them went to two-year junior colleges and finished in a four-year university. Those kids at the Ivy League schools got an advantage right out of college. They were higher on the ladder, but after 15 years, there was no marked difference between these two groups when it comes to income, influence, and contentment. And so parents are pushing kids. Kids are feeling stressed. In a, in a school like this, I, maybe you have bought into this. Why? Because we're desperate to make sure our kids can have the best life possible. You know, there is a college for your kid. It doesn't matter, ultimately, according to the research, where they go. It doesn't even matter if they want to be an artist and they want to study that or an actor, or a musician. Because maybe their values aren't that they have a lot of money and two cars and a big fancy house. Maybe their values are that they express themselves. I got sidetracked. Respect. I'll get there. Respect. Our kids want to respect us. Thank you, though. Our kids want to... I'm taking you on the road with me. We'll have to travel separately because, you know, I'm married. But anyway, watch. Here's the deal. I did this today in the assembly, and I did it on purpose, because I was in a very difficult situation. Normally, this school, I've been here for years, is like a piece of cake. These people know how to run a school. They know how to put it on an assembly. I mean, they've got departments. They've got, they start in prayer, you know, everything, even though he left. Everything, right? They care about the kids, and, and here's the deal. It's usually a cakewalk, but today I went in, and we had to do two assemblies because we didn't want to overpopulate. And um, so we did the seniors and sophomores, and then we did the juniors and freshmen. And they had them on both sides of the assembly so they could be spread out, both sides of the gym. So I'm working the gym floor. It means half the time my, I'm either not facing anyone or my back or back of my head is to them. That's a challenge. And particularly in the second assembly, because I know there's freshmen who haven't been, been in a school yet. yet. And, and don't, don't really know how to, to do it very well. well. They, they don't, don't know, know how, how to do their, their social, social life. They're, they're, they, they missed out. out. And by, by the way, way don't, don't panic. panic. You know, you know, all the research, research indicates that kids, kids are behind where they were before the pandemic. But the, the experts, experts are telling us they're, they're going to catch up, up, and it's okay that they're behind. We expect them to be. It's, it's going to be fine in the end. end. This, this happens, happens to individuals all the time. It just happens to be happening to our culture. culture. So, so what, what I did is I remembered the broken window theory. I don't know if you've heard of the broken window theory. I read a book by Malcolm Gladwell. He's an intriguing author. He wrote, he wrote a book, and in there he talks about the broken window theory. theory. It's, it's a sociological, sociological theory that says this. 
If, if you're, you're in charge, charge of an, an urban, urban area and, and a window gets, gets broken, you better fix that window because if you don't, pretty soon, soon all the windows are going to get broken. Those small crimes will lead to larger crimes. So focus on the small crimes. Now, it's very controversial, but Giuliani, remember that guy? He's been in the news recently. But he was a, the mayor of New York. He went in and he wholeheartedly believed in this theory. He told his new chief of police, take as much of your budget and throw it at these five things. And they were all those small crimes. One was broken windows, another one was vandalism, another one was a squeegee man who washed windows at red lights and forced people to pay, another one was public urination, another one was jumping in the turnstiles to get into the subway for free. He said, deal with that. And a beautiful thing happened. They would watch the guys graffiti these trains and they would wait. These guys would sneak in and were there at the end of the track and they would do beautiful artwork. These graffiti artists are incredibly skilled. And they would wait till they were done. And people were gathering their cans and whatever it was, they would walk out with a big spray thing and they'd spray it all gray again. And eventually, they put their resources to that they stopped getting the same kind of graffiti on the trains. Well, people were upset. What about the syndicate? You know, what about the mob? What about crime? What about murder? He said, we're going to deal with those things, but this is our focus. You track crime, large and small, in New York City, starting at that time, and for the following 12, 12 years, both small and large crimes went to the lowest level in the history of New York City. And it stayed that way for 12 solid years. Now, I'm not a sociologist, but there's one thing I've had more experience than anybody, and that's start standing in front of large groups of teenagers. I know all the, the men and women who do this, and I just happen to have done it more, and I feel very lucky and fortunate about that. And so I've, I've got thousands of assemblies under my belt. My main passion now is helping parents. With all that I've learned from these experiences, I feel like I've been entrusted with this beautiful gift. But what I used to do when someone would disrespect me or be talking, and this happened today, this girl up on the, happened to be on that side of the gym both times. This girl was talking. Oh, they, there was a bunch of people around. I'm a minute into my assembly, and I stopped, and I addressed the problem. If you want to speak in front of a group of teenagers, it seems so counterintuitive to be the guy who's telling somebody to shut up. I spoke at a school with 3,200 people, and it was a third and fourth generation gang school. They didn't want to have one assembly because they were afraid of violence. I talked to the principal into having one and getting some extra security. The police were there, it was pretty cool. But I spoke and I knew I was going to be tested and disrespected. Literally 20 seconds into my first story, and stories are powerful, you should be telling your kids stories, because that's what they're going to remember. But anyway, so this kid stood up, his baseball hat was on sideways, and he stood up and yelled, you suck! Everyone laughed. And I thought to myself, there's a broken window. And if I don't deal with that broken window, pretty soon all the windows are going to break. And by the way, what I'm about to tell you, has a great effect for us and for you in your own house. What I used to do in those circumstances is make jokes like, oh, I remember going through puberty when I was challenged. You know, oh, you haven't gone through it yet? Oh, that's okay. And I, like, I was trying to do this thing, be their peer. Now, today I made that joke because somebody made a really weird noise up there. Something fell and was loud and distracted everyone, so I made that joke. But it wasn't a discipline situation. But I used to try to discipline them and control them through humor, and it didn't work. The windows, windows will keep breaking. breaking. So, so this, this is what, what I, I do now. And I did it today. I stopped that day and I said, young man, with the hat. And I was fortunate that I actually saw him. He was in the corner. I said, yeah, look at me. You could have heard a pin drop. I lowered the microphone knowing full well everyone was leaning forward. Like, what's he going to do? And I knew this was my moment to either win or lose their respect. And respect is everything. And so what I said to that young man, while everyone's listening, I said, if you interrupt us again, I'm going to stop and I'm going to... Make sure you leave this room, and here's why. And then I gave him a bigger reason. You can't give a reason for respect that has to do with your ego or seems like it does, or your position in their life. Why? Because I couldn't say I'm a speaker or I'm an adult, because he's got adults in his life that he doesn't respect, and they're not worthy of his respect. So I said, if I hear you again, I'm going to kick you out, and here's why. Here's the bigger reason. I said, what we're going to get today is so important, I'm not going to let you get in the way of the people around you hearing it. Now, that's a great big reason. You argue with that, you're a jerk. And then I looked at him again, I said, do you understand? And he just looked at me with his cold face, hard expression. I said, nod your head, do you understand? And he went, whatever. And given the circumstance, I thought, well, I'll give him a little grace. I said, thank you. Don't test me or I will kick you out. Now, typically, I'll go back to that person within a minute. 
and, and I will stop everything, and I did it today, and turn and say, hey, I just, this might sound weird to everybody, but I just want to thank you, man, I'm so proud of you for the way you responded to my discipline with such respect. Now I'm putting myself as a disciplinarian, not before that. And then, and then I say, this might, might sound really corny, corny, but would you all do me a favor and clap to thank him for how he just responded to me? What, what I'm doing is making him the hero of the story. It's not about ego. Typically, they stand up and they wave like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then they sit down and they say, don't test me because I will kick you out. Everyone usually goes, whoa. And then I jump back into my story. And you know what? It works. Why? Because they all want an adult in life who's willing to back up what they say, even if they don't like it. In the kitchen, our bigger reason, it happened with Jake. He was his sister before she went to school. He called her a jerk. And I said, um, Jake, come here. He goes, what? And he was really angry. He goes, well, she's a jerk. I said, Jake, and here's the bigger reason. There has to be a consequence. And we're going to get to that with this freedom thing. There has to be a consequence for this, Jake. Why? Because my job is to prepare you to live life without me. And when you leave our house, every relationship you have is going to be built on respect. And if I let you think it's okay to be disrespectful to anyone in our family, I'm not loving you well. So now let's talk about what freedom you're going to lose. That's our bigger reason. It's not, don't talk to your sister like that. Well, he knows that. He's, he's mad, he's out of control. Typically, you'll say, go hang out somewhere else for 20 minutes, and then we'll come in and talk to you about what's going to happen next. Why 20 minutes? Because it's a part of your brain that's open to persuasion and shuts down. Now, we don't do this perfectly, but it helps us take a deep breath and not react. This way, we can respond. Respect is so incredibly important. And let's talk now about consequences and about this issue of freedom. I want to honor your time, so I'm going to... I could go on for hours. Let me just tell you this. Um, we're, I just finished producing an, an hour, it's just over an hour, of a webinar. And this webinar goes into detail, it's very visual, and it's completely free. We haven't released it yet, we hope to release it in the next three to four weeks. If you want that webinar, I'm going to give you my email address, and you can just send me a note, you can even do it now on your phone, and if you're at home, just send me a note, say, give it to me, or whatever you want. Just give me your first name and your email, I promise we're not going to spam you. There is one thing that we are going to tell you about, and that's coming up, and that's uh, we're going to release in the new year a master class, a video master class for parents of preteens and teenagers. Been working on it for a few years. I'll also send you this free video about the reset conversation and how to, how, what do you do if your kid won't even listen to you? How do you reset your relationship with them? Um, it's a little eight-minute video. I'll send you that as well. But just here's my email address. Just put Tyler at HopeForParents.com. Very simple. And again, you don't have to write anything. If I get something that just says send it or just your first name, that's what I need. Your first name, and I'll have your email address, and we will let you know when the webinar is available, and we'll actually send out this, this reset conversation to you. Um, and again, we're not going to spam you. But here's the thing. One last time, Tyler at HopeForParents.com. Okay. I had a dad when I was beginning in my career in Canada. You know, you know any Canadians? Nicest, nicest people on the planet. planet. In, in my experience, the Australians, Australians are pretty nice. New Zealanders, but Aus Canadians are our nice, gentle neighbors, neighbors in the north. My two of my neighbors are Canadians where we live in Luna Beach. Super sweet. Well, I was in Canada speaking. I've made a lot of friends since this is the beginning of my career, and here's what happened. I walk into a room. See the whiteboard? There's a picture of my face filling half the size, and on the other side is this Tyler Durman teenage expert. And I walked in and saw this giant poster, and I thought, oh, crap. I'd only spoken to maybe 40,000 to 50,000 kids at that point. I was no expert on teenagers. And I thought, I'll do my hour, 15 minutes, and then I'm not going to do a Q&A. I'm just going to get out of here. That way they won't know that I don't really know much. Well, there's this nice man. He didn't even move. He looked like a statue on a bench in a mall. You know those fake people that they have? He hadn't moved the whole time. And at the end, I said, well, thank you. People went to get to clap, and he went. I was like, oh, crap. I said, yes. yes. He leans forward, 450 parents and some teachers in the room. It was packed. It had begun snowing while I was speaking. I could see it out the back window. And my veins went cold, and I thought, what's going to happen? He says, Tyler, and everyone listens. My daughter is 14. She wants a boyfriend. I told her she's not ready for that. She's angry. Am I doing the right thing? 450 people in that room went like this. 
I don't, I don't even remember, remember what I said. I just, I just remember drinking hot chocolate, chocolate in my hotel, hotel that night, looking out the window, thinking I owed that guy more than what I gave him. And I thought, I'm going to start finding answers to this. I won't go over the whole process of that, but I'm going to share with you the answer to that dad's question. In fact, in the book, it'll be available afterwards. I have written down, as well, I was writing this part of the book, I wrote down for word for word what I would tell that dad. Whether he's a raccoon or not, I would tell that dad that... Um, what, what I would say, say to him now, having learned, learned what I've learned. learned. And, and here's, here's where it goes. I started, I started asking kids about this issue of freedom. The first thing I learned, I learned was this. And this, this is the dilemma, dilemma for us as parents. Don't miss this. This, this is going to build on top of this. When, when our, our kids, kids do not get the freedom they think they're, they're ready, ready for, they think we don't trust them. them. And that's, that's a huge, huge problem because when they don't feel trustworthy, they're less likely. Trusted, they're less likely to be trustworthy. The, the second, second thing, thing they feel is frustration like we do not know them and we do not get them. them. This, this is the research, research I started doing when I talked to kids, kids about their parents. And I realized there was a dilemma and it, was just, it, was, it became more complicated. I also learned that when our kids have a little bit of hope, and this is the good news, when our kids have a little bit of hope about anything, it transforms them. That's, That's a human characteristic. Kids I've talked to, and there's been dozens and dozens who are suicidal, I can tell. I ask the question, they're in immediate crisis. Those kids, when I give them a little strategy for how they can deal with whatever it is, it's not going to draw on the whiteboard, is he? Okay. The masked man. Never trust the masked man. Okay, watch. When, when our, our kids, kids get a little strategy, now I would always uh, connect a suicidal student up with somebody in an authority in their school. Um, but in our initial conversation, I noticed, I'd give them a strategy, like about their relationship with their dad. I would say, here's some ideas about how to rebuild our relationship. It was like, it was like the sun came out. A little bit of hope went a long way. So here's a statement. I know some of you are taking notes, but watch. You ready? Is there more behind me? It's the whole family? Dad, see, he doesn't care. He walks ahead. You ever notice when, when the family's bike riding, it's always the dad ahead? Like, I'm so bored, I've got to be the first one. Like, my family needs me to leave them on. Which street we're going to go on? Share the road. Okay, anyway, watch. My brother's a bicycle rider. And, like, just, anyway. So, this is the solution to all of this. Your kid needs the hope that they can affect the amount of freedom in their lives. And when, when your kid feels that they cannot affect the amount of freedom in their lives, they are likely to secretly push back and do, and that's where rebellion comes in. Why? Because they have a growing need for autonomy. And when they, we deny them that sense that there's a hope that they can grow in their autonomy, they're going to find it one way or another. And so we had a conversation, I'm just going to run through it. Um, I don't know what happened to my marker. Oh, here it is. We um, had a conversation with Kayla when he turned 13. Brooke wanted to listen. She had just turned, just about to turn 11. And here's what it was. We sat Kayla down. Chris and I both spoke, but I'll just do it all in my voice. And I'm going to fly through this. But here's the answer to freedom and to consequences and to motivation. It's all wrapped up in this. I'm going to try to do it in the next seven minutes. We sat him down with these papers. I had a big a carpenter's pencil. I'm not a carpenter. I'm envious of people who make things with their hands. You know, you know, I have friends who can drive by a house and point it and go, hey, baby, I pulled that. that. All I get to say is, I said words there. You know, it's not that cool. But anyway, I have a carpenter pencil and a big eraser, and we sit down, and he goes, am I in trouble? I said, no, we've got great news. And I drew a big circle on the top piece of paper. He goes, what's the good news? I said, we, this is great. We want you to have total freedom. I'm going to lead you through the conversation. There's two conversations you should have with your kids. One is the reset conversation. I'll send you that quick video. It begins to deal with that. And then the freedom conversation. We'll just touch across the surface of it. Here we go. There's more details in the book and in what I'm going to be sending you. But um, Caleb sits up and he goes, what? I said, we want you to have total freedom. The sooner you have it, the better. He said, really? I said, yeah. He goes, why? I said, because it'll make our lives wonderful. 
if we never have to worry about you and give you any expectations because you're that mature and responsible, it will make our lives heaven. I said it would be so cool on a Sunday night to kiss mom goodnight and then to roll back over toward her and say, I haven't seen Brooke since she left for school on Friday morning. And then her mom go, oh, you know Brooke, she's probably helping nuns with homeless people. It's going to be fine. I said that would make our lives amazing. He smiled. She giggled. I said, you get it? We are on your side, not your back. You want freedom. We want the same thing. We want you to have total freedom. And that was advocate. Kristen and I both. I said, Caleb, do you remember when you were little and we had a fence around the play area? He goes, yeah. I said, why did we put a fence around the, 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 the play area? He goes, um, so we would play? He's not that bright, okay? Everyone's got a dumb kid. I said, I think no, actually he's pretty intelligent in some ways. Um, he's got his first for real girlfriend right now, and we like her, which is nice. I drew a picture of a street. And by the way, in case you don't think this stuff might work, I'm not suggesting you become a military parent. Caleb was over to watch Jake play football. He drove up from Point Loma, and at night, uh, Jake was out eating pizza with the team, and Caleb turned to us and said, you guys, can I talk to you about something? And we had these conversations. Our 20-year-old, almost 21-year-old son said, why shouldn't I have sex with my girlfriend? He said, we were alone in the dorm, and it started, and I, I thought, I probably should do this, but I didn't know why. And I'm like, I'm a failure as a dad, that he doesn't have any framework to make his own choice. I said, well, Caleb, you've got to make your own choices about your life, but here's some things. And we talked for like a half hour, and he goes, okay, fine. And it was totally normal. It wasn't like, oh, my gosh. You know, he's like, you know, we even made jokes, you know, and, and he loves the office, so he made a few, that's what she said, jokes. But anyway, watch. We have great communication, but when he just turned 13, I said, Caleb, why? I drew the street, and he said, oh, so we wouldn't run in the street and get killed. I said, exactly. I said, Caleb, every fence, every boundary we put up in your life, every expectation is just like that fence. It's there to give you area to enjoy freedom, but to protect you from things you're not ready for. He goes, okay. I said, Caleb, I'll give you another paragraph. I said, remember in sixth, seventh grade, you and he's in eighth grade at the time. I said, remember when you came home from school, remember what a pain homework was? He goes, yeah. Oh, he was so annoying. No, I don't have any homework. No, I swear I don't. And then you go to say goodnight and say, oh, I forgot I got a vocabulary test. And you just want to kill him, you know? And go get the scissors out of the kitchen island. And, and, and so he was a pain. So I wrote in that circle, I wrote homework first. I said, hey, remember what we told you? He goes, yeah, I had to come home before I did anything else. I had to do my homework and prove to you that it was done. And we had his teachers have to sign off on it. And we were like, Caleb, you've got to learn this discipline. He goes, yeah, I remember that. I said, actually, we didn't make you do your homework first. You've got to come home and have a snack, have some downtime, and do your chores. By the way, your kids should do chores. Chores are like a mini reset button that tells your kid every day, the world does not exist for you, you exist for the sake of the world. The family does not exist for you, you exist for the sake of the family. You should go to YouTube, and I forget her name, but it's this parenting thing where she cites the most, um, one of the most respected longitudinal studies in history. Harvard did this study from birth past middle life, and they discovered, according to the metric, that adults who grew up to be the most successful and healthy human beings, they all had one thing in common. Among other things, the thing that surprised everyone is every one of those healthy people did chores and were not paid for them when they were children. When we pay our kids for chores, what we are telling them is your hired hand. We lose the whole point of chores. They don't like it, but that's okay. Why? Because we have a bigger reason. We're preparing you to serve the family. I was on TV in Canada on their biggest talk show. It's called The, the Social. It's like The View, Four Women on a Couch. Hugh Jackman was the second guest. I was the first guest. The first, oh, by the way, my wife loves Hugh Jackman. She said, did you talk to him? I said, yeah. She said, what did you say? And I literally said this to you. I met him. I said, it's great to meet you. I love your work. I admire you so much. And you're my wife's free pass. <laughs> she said, you said that to him? And I said, no. And she like, was angry, but delighted. <laughs> like, maybe he'd stop by. But anyway, so they asked me on that couch, why are kids today have such a reputation for being entitled? And the answer is simple. We are teaching them that they are the center of the world. We are teaching them by serving them all the time, protecting them all the time, that, they, that the adults in their lives are there to make and keep them happy. I said, Caleb, 
you did, did your chores first. first. By, By the way, way your kids, kids maybe should get allowance. We believe that your kids should get allowance. They should be able to succeed and fail with that money any way they want. And we shouldn't mandate it. Um, that way, one day, their, their brother or sister is going to be able to buy the new iPhone, and they're going to have no money because they bought donuts and fed it to the, the little rodents at school. Okay. How much are you paying, by the way, to send your kids to the school? I would, I would make a call. Okay. Anyway. I said, Caleb, do we have that rule anymore in your life? You're in eighth grade. You're on the honor roll. He goes, no. I said, when's the last time we asked you about your homework? He said, never. Well, Mom does sometimes. I said, yeah, she's working on that. I said, but what? I said, we never ask you about your homework. Why? And this is the good news, Caleb. In every fence, there is a gate. And I erased, and I drew a picture of a gate, and I drew an arrow. And I drew a bigger circle, and I wrote the words, more freedom. I said, Caleb, remember, we're on your side, not your back. We want you to have total freedom, but you have to earn it. Brooke, go and take this 3 by 5 card, and I wrote on it, and hang it in our kitchen above the other sign. We have two signs in our kitchen. One says, freedom is earned. And the other sign says, we are not the Kardashians. And when anyone acts entitled in our home, and, and oh, you ate the last ice cream without even the last donut, that was mom's. We pointed them and called them Kim for 20 minutes, okay? Um, it's more fun with the boys than with the girl. But watch. Freedom is earned. If you're taking notes, write those words down because it's a mantra in our family. You, we want you to earn more freedom. So we have the gates. We're the gatekeepers. We'll open any gate as soon as possible. Once you show you're responsible for the freedom you have, we will give you more freedom. It's that simple. Why? Because we want you to have total freedom. He immediately said, can I have an iPhone? I got another piece of paper. We recycle, so it's okay. And in that piece of paper, in that circle, I drew a picture of a flip phone. I think Caleb was the only kid in the movie who had a flip phone. He was so mad he hated his flip phone. Text the letter C. One, two, three. He hated this phone. Everyone else had those slide-up phones with a keyboard or an iPhone. He wanted an iPhone so bad. I said, Caleb, you can totally have an iPhone. He says, really? What do I have? What's the catch? I said, you just have to show you're responsible with your phone. You can't walk around with your earbuds in. You know, you can't be on the screen. We have a rule you can't be on the screen in our family when we're in the car. Unless you're working the music. Why? Because that's when we have great times. And when we started this rule, we were behind the eight ball a bit. When we started this rule, oh, Brooke got so mad. She said, well, I don't want to talk. We said, fine, don't talk. She said, I'm going to go to sleep. I said, have a good nap. And she was listening and got so engrossed in the conversation. About ten minutes later, she got a part of it. We have the best conversations in the car. The screen, we've taught our kids that the person in the room or the car is more important than the screen. There's going to be a lot of information in that webinar about screens and some three secrets that will really help you, foundational principles, um, will help you with that. So don't forget to send that email. But um, I said, Caleb, you know, you can't forget it. you got to make sure it's charged. When we call, you answer it. And I told him this. I have checked with the police. It is legal for us to take away your phone. And he said, oh, no. But it, I, no. I paid for my phone. I said, yeah, no, you paid for that phone the energy you have because we've been feeding you vegetables since you were a little boy. And one day you're going to pay us back. And by the way, your bedroom is not your bedroom. It's my future office. I'm just letting you use it for a while. And he laughed. He goes, I get the point. I said, we can take anything away. You have nothing. Except our love. So now, and we have a lot of fun in our family, as hopefully you can tell. But Caleb went across the street. Talk about motivation. He negotiated with the woman. And... Oh, well, I'll say it anyway. She probably won't watch this. She's crazy. We have a crazy woman across the street. I don't know what it looks like on the other side of the fence, but at the front yard is just a disaster. He went across. She's a big pine tree. He negotiated $10 an hour for five hours of work that following Saturday. He came home dirty, tired, weak, with his chest and sh out and shoulders up and his head high and showed me the $50. Caleb ended up earning his iPhone. And it was, it was a beautiful day, and let me wrap this up. The gates swing both ways. Brooke came in shortly after that and said, oh, and he was coming from the car, too. Kristen had just picked him up. Oh, but guess what? Caleb's friends told me, during leadership class, he's been taking his iPhone, telling his teacher he doesn't feel good, going in the bathroom and playing Madden football in the stall for like 20 minutes a day. What are you going to do? I said, oh, I love the information. We're not big on tattling, but thanks for the information. She goes, can I watch? I said, yeah. Just go on the couch. Pretend you're not watching, though. Pretend you're not listening. She goes over there, pretended to be busy. He comes in next. He goes, hey, Alma. I said, hey, how was school? He goes, great. I said, how was leadership class? He goes, good. 
I said, how's Madden football? Did the Brewers tell you? And he went off. And I just let him go off for about 30 seconds. You don't want anything. Why do you have to say anything about it? And what about the things I can say? I said, Kevin, hold on. Hold on. This is not your consequence. Just go in your room. I'll be in in about 22 minutes. This isn't a punishment at all. I just want to talk to you. 22 minutes. They're used to that now in our family. And I went in the room. Brooke was like, <laughs> I went in the room, and I sat down, and Caleb already knows that the gates swing both ways. When you earn freedom, and you show you're not ready for that freedom, that gate swings the other direction, and you lose that freedom. Caleb took his, well, before he did, I said, Caleb, he goes, well, why is Brooke I said, I don't but glad you, uh, blame you for being mad. That would bug me, too. I'm going to talk to her about tattling and stuff. But I'm glad she told me. Well, why? I said, because one of our non-negotiables in our family is lying. You lied to your teacher. You lied to the other students in your class, those kids who read your poster and voted for you to be in leadership. You said you'd do everything you could for them, and you lied to us by hiding this. How many weeks have you been doing this? He said, just since I got the phone. He took his phone out of the back pocket and handed it to me and didn't ask how long we were going to keep it. Why? Two principles. Number one, when they lose the freedom, we have taught them the greatest way to earn that freedom back is how they handle the loss of that freedom. When we took Brooke's phone for lying, right to my face three times she lied about the phone and what she'd been doing on it. This is later. When I took her phone, she's like, well, how long are you going to keep it? And we're like, well, longer now. Because it's not about the phone, it's about the lying, right? Our job is to prepare you to live life without us. And you don't have to like this, but... Give me your phone. And, and we're not going to tell you how long we're going to keep it. And it's not going to be forever. But your attitude is going to show us when you're ready. I'll talk to you tomorrow and see if you can tell me why we took away your phone. Next time we talked to Brooke, you because I was on Instagram. I said, no. Keep thinking, though. Although you were on Instagram, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Eventually, she's like, because I lied to you. I was like, yeah. Caleb. And Brooke would walk through our living room like, well, I guess I'm not going to do anything this weekend because all my friends communicate through Snapchat. So I guess I've lost my social life. And I smiled myself and thought, there's that passive aggressive behavior. We don't want to reward us. That another couple of days. Brooke lost her phone for like nine days. Caleb got his back in five. The first thing is, when your kid breaks your trust, you do not need to tell them, you've ruined my trust. How can I ever trust you again? They already know they've broken your trust. We don't want to shame them. We want home to be the safest place they can go when they fail. They're going to run somewhere. So how we react to their failure is a big deal. Lectures don't work. So when our kids lose their freedom, this is what we say to our kids. And I said it that day. Chris and I have figured this whole thing out. I said, Caleb, we are going to give you every chance to regain this freedom. We want you to have it back. You see what I'm saying is it's not me against you. It's not punitive. It's not because I'm in a bad mood or a jerk. You lost the freedom because of your behavior, right? It means it takes us out of this, you such a jerk thing. And what it does is it lets them know we're on their side. We're, we'll just watch you. You can earn it back, hopefully soon, whatever that might be. It also is a motivating thing because freedom is everything to them. And so we take away their freedom. Sometimes it's time. Brooke lost an hour of her freedom on Saturday to do chores, which she hates. Jake's chores because she called him an idiot. And so she did his chores with spider webs in the planter, right? And she could have had four hours of freedom. And I said, you've lost your first hour. And if you don't do a good job, you'll keep doing it. Why? Because you can't treat people that way. We try to associate everything with this concept of the freedom that they deserve to own. Does that make sense? And I, I could go on and on. You guys, the books are back there. They're chock full of stuff. Um, if you enjoy tonight, you will love the book. Um, it's just me being me, being goofy. And um, some, uh, You're reading it. Your friend recommended it to you. That's pretty cool. Thank you. If you're at home, you can get it online on Amazon. The book is called Counterintuitive. Counterintuitive, and the subtitle is What Four Million Teenagers Wish We Knew. And uh, it's a book for parents, and, and teachers love it too. Um, tonight, it's in the back, it's cheaper than it is online. It's $13 for one book, and that includes tax. And if you want a second book for someone who's not here, I'll sell you a second book for $7. So that would be two for 20 So um, now don't get into cahoots with somebody sitting next to you. Like, here's 10 bucks on each in the parking lot. Okay, that would be wrong. All right, um, I've got all these kids in college. And so um, anyway, that's back there. We'll take credit card. We'll take cash. We've got change. If you have cash, you don't have to wait in line or anything. You just throw it on the bench and grab a book. Um, and, oh, and if you have that, uh, what do you call it? What is it? No, not Apple Pay. 
Venmo, thank you. Yeah, well, you can do the credit card thing. We don't have the Apple Pay one, though. But anyway, thank you. I, guess. I should do it. I'm not that hip. Um, Venmo, all you have to do is to go to Hope for Parents, that at Hope for Parents. You're going to have a choice whether it's a person or a business. You click on the business, and that's where you can do the Venmo thing. And you don't have to show us or anything. Just do it. Every book you pay $13 for, you get one for 7 if you want that. So you don't buy one for 13 and then buy 50 for seven, that's not how it works. It's, you, you get the point. All right, you evil people. Okay, um, that's how you afford your kids to go to the school. All right, is it expensive to the school? It is? Oh, next year I'm going to get more. Okay, hope for parents. That's how you can do it on Venmo. You guys, I'll even sign the books um, to make them worth 25 more cents at the garage sale. And by the way, guys, um, the chapters are short enough for men to read on the toilet before their legs go numb. So I wrote it that way for you. It's all story driven. Thanks so much, you guys. Um, I'll be in the back. I hope I get to meet you. And thank you for coming. Thanks for all of you at home um, for staying with us. See you guys.